Sun Valley, Idaho is a haven for junkies. Adrenaline junkies, that is. But when a successful family is torn apart by a brutal crime... The only thing I've heard is that the police don't think it's random. This winter wonderland becomes gripped in fear. I heard they thought it was the person living in the guest house. As the locals hunker down, hoping to survive the most violent storm in centuries. Farmhand Robbie Datchler doesn't believe in handouts, except when it comes to her miniature horses and donkeys. They're very people-oriented. They come right up to you and want to know what you have in your pockets. But there's more to Robbie's life than just her four-legged friends. When she's not minding the pasture, she's tending the phone lines at the Blaine County Emergency Communications Center. 911, what is your emergency? The initial call came in from the neighbor and the neighbor's daughter had run to her home and was reporting that her parents had been shot. The emergency lines are jammed with 16-year-old Sarah Johnson's neighbors calling for help. There have been two gunshots. Um, okay, you need to get a hold of yourself and okay. tell me from where. Those shots were inside the house. They shot one house. Officers race to the home Sarah shares with her parents, Diane and Alan Johnson. These two people have been shot. At the scene, Blaine County Sheriff Walt Femling steps into his worst nightmare. When I first came into the house, uh, there was a long hallway, and I walked into the uh, master bedroom, and it was just really a horrific scene. Blood everywhere throughout the entire bedroom. Within seconds, the most terrifying discovery is revealed. I saw two deceased bodies uh, within the bedroom. Lying before him are Diane and Alan Johnson, shot dead in cold blood. I could see a rifle. Has the killer made a huge mistake, carelessly leaving behind a crucial piece to his identity? I left that scene and uh, called everybody out. The loss of Alan and Diane Johnson turns this posh ski town into a bitterly cold community. It's awful. You just never know. I have kids. Somebody could be looking over your shoulder at any time. It's scary. You know, on the surface, everyone looks so picture perfect. But you do a little digging and there's always a darker side. The entire community is skating on thin ice knowing somewhere in this valley hides a most vicious killer. Meanwhile, investigators are on the move. When I walked into the house and seen the bodies in the room, it was probably one of the worst things I'd ever seen. As Detective Steve Harkins takes over, he knows just where to start. I found out that Sarah Johnson, the daughter of Alan and Diane Johnson, was inside the house when the gunshots occurred. Sadly, Sarah may have been an eyewitness to her parents' murders. Investigators sit down with a grieving daughter to talk about her terrifying ordeal. She was upset. She was crying, visibly distraught. She uh, couldn't give me uh, any suspects in the, uh, um, of someone who would do something like this. But someone did, and with a heartless killer on the loose, there will be no easy answers. I knew this was going to be a tough case. Not even sub-freezing temps will stop the shredders on these slopes. But murmurs of murder are totally killing the buzz of the most wicked borders. I can't believe it can happen in this beautiful place. And this place is changing. I know, it's heading down hills like we live in L.A. now. But what about the family? I mean, is there kids or anything else? Yeah, involved? there's a daughter and a, and a son just left behind. I don't know, can you imagine how that would feel? If only everybody could just ride their worries away. Unfortunately, Detective Harkins doesn't have that luxury. With no suspects in the Johnson's murder, he turns his focus to the evidence found at the scene. When we went in the house, we found a right-handed leather glove. We were quite sure that the rifle found in the bedroom was the murder weapon. But that's not the only gun they locate on the premises. We also found another rifle out in the garage of the residence. Does a killer really need two rifles? He does, if he brings a friend. Both rifles were sent to the Idaho State Lab uh, for ballistics testing. Rumors of a deadly duo rip through town like a shell from a rifle. But when the lab results come in, 
it looks like a talk could be a little off target. The rifle found in the master bedroom near the homicide victims was in fact the weapon that was used to kill them. As for the rifle in the garage, that belonged to the Johnsons. With the pieces of the puzzle falling into place, investigators now need to trace the mysterious rifle to its rightful owner. How we found out who the rifle belongs to? And when they do, they come upon a most unexpected suspect. We found out that it belonged to Mel Spiegel, who was a close, dear friend of Alan and Diane Johnson, who was living in the guest house on the property at the time of the homicides. Some friend. This new lead casts a frosty chill across Sun Valley. Did the Johnson's house guest pay his final month's lease with two bullets and a pull of the trigger? Relaxation is never sweeter than after a day of skiing on an icy mountain. And for local ski bunny Katie, what's sweeter still is a post-ski massage by Judy Townell. It feels really good. It's good on my shoulders. But news of the tragic deaths of Diane and Alan Johnson has made Judy's job even harder, despite her magic fingers. Like, I don't understand how somebody could just kill two innocent people. I heard they thought it was the person living in the guest house. Really? Because they found his rifle. Oh, my very gosh. Simple. Could Sun Valley's answer to Kato Kalin actually be history's most discourteous house guest? Investigators pay a little visit to hear Mel Spiegel's side of the story. During the interview, Mr. Spiegel told detectives that he was in Boise on the morning of the homicides. Sure you were, Mel. And your gun just happened to have been used in a double homicide while you were out of town. But when police investigate Mel's alibi, it seems to check out. We did this through a family member's, his wife, and also credit card transactions at convenience stores in the Boise area. After a thorough investigation, Mel proves he's an honest player. He's eliminated as a suspect. No one is more relieved to hear this news than Mel himself. I was totally out of town when it happened, so I'd had nothing to even remotely think that I would have done it. So, there you have it. That may be, but Mel is still haunted by one fact that will never change. Man, that's the one thing that gets me. It's my rifle. Yeah, that's the big one. But if it wasn't Mel who shot Diane and Alan Johnson, just who was it? With nowhere else to turn, investigators go back to the Johnson's daughter, Sarah, who's been staying with relatives since the murders. Days after the homicide, we brought Sarah into the sheriff's office to see if she was more uh, comfortable to talk, uh, so she wasn't so emotional. While she has no idea who would kill her parents, Sarah shares an intriguing secret that just may turn this investigation around. During an interview with Sarah, she told me she was involved in a relationship with a 19-year-old boy. I later found out that this 19-year-old boy, his name was Bruno Santos, and he was an illegal immigrant from Mexico. But clearly, Bruno's greatest crime was stealing young Sarah's heart. Sarah really, really loved Bruno. But Sarah's dad, on the other hand, not so much. That met with a lot of friction, and then she started doing some sneak arounds like probably teenagers do. But in this case, it was serious, and the parents didn't want that to continue. For Detective Harkins, this may be just the break he's been hoping for. After learning of this relationship that Sarah was involved in, we found out that the parents did not approve of this relationship, and Bruno became a suspect immediately. News of good girl Sarah's teenage crush on bad boy Bruno sends the town's rumor mill into high gear. I don't know exactly what happened, but you know she was so enthralled with this older man that um, he may have something to do with what happened you know, to the parents' death. It's a crazy deal. It really is. Investigators turn up the heat on Bruno Santos. And as Detective Harkins and Sheriff Fenling learn, there's more to this lead than just Bruno's immigration status. We discovered that a couple of days before the murder, Alan had found uh, Sarah had stayed the night there and uh, confronted Bruno. Was it a physical altercation or what kind of uh, altercation was it? I think it was verbal. Uh, he mainly confronted him and said, you better stay away from my daughter. And Alan, being a resourceful dad, knew how to make his word law. We do know that uh, 
Alan had told a family member he was going to go to the police and report Bruno for statutory rape. Right. Why am I going on Tuesday to report this? What an odd coincidence. The very day Alan was going to report Bruno to the police, he and his wife turn up dead. Perhaps Bruno is a betting man, willing to gamble a life behind bars before facing rape charges against his girl. It's another perfect winter day at the Sun Valley Ski Resort. But with panic about an unsolved double homicide blanketing the town, it's not the fresh powder that gets these people talking. So have you heard any more about the Johnson murders? The only thing I've heard is that the police don't think it's random. So it's somebody they knew, I guess. Somebody from the valley, then they think. Oh, well, I'd assume. Somebody they had some kind of disagreement with or problem with. I hadn't heard all that. But there's something these ski bums don't know. With Sarah's father about to file statutory rape charges against her boyfriend, Bruno may have found a clever way to save his American freedom. During an interview with Bruno, I asked him if he was involved in the homicides. Uh, he told me he wasn't. He told me he didn't have any knowledge of it, and he was at home with his mom on that morning. Not surprisingly, Bruno's family backs up his alibi. After all, not even a killer's mom would sell out her own son. I always felt that Bruno may have had something to do with it. And police think so, too especially after they discover one of the qualities Bruno found most attractive in Dear Sarah. Sarah would often tell him how much money her parents had, and that if they would get married, they would have a lot of money and be able to build a house. And that sounded pretty good to Bruno. He was ready to make his American dream become a reality. She actually had a ring that Bruno had given her, and uh, that was a shock. That was a shock. But Sarah's parents were determined not to let their daughter throw her life away in the arms of a Latin lover. She wanted to go away with Bruno. And regardless of what the parents thought, she's going to do it. It looks like it does take two to tango. Is it possible Bruno had a partner in this double murder? Bruno could remember on a couple of occasions Sarah making a statement out of anger that uh, she wished that her parents were dead. But what high-strung teenager doesn't want to kill mommy and daddy from time to time? Okay, we'll see After talking with Bruno and learning about the relationship uh, between him and Sarah, and also of him telling us about the animosity it caused with Sarah and her parents, we became intrigued by this. With more information coming to light, the talk of Sarah's involvement sends chills through the skaters at Sun Valley Resort. So you hear that the police are looking towards Sarah and the murder of her parents? Sarah? The daughter? Yeah, I guess that they have their newest lead is uh, something about her and her boyfriend or something. It can't be. That, that would be just sick. Detective Harkins finds this latest development disturbing as well. But what's really bothering this veteran cop is the lack of evidence. Hoping their luck will change, investigators go back to the scene of the crime. After officers arrived shortly on scene, there was garbage set out for collection. And everybody knows one man's trash is another man's treasure. Officers stopped the garbage truck. We found valuable information in the trash can. Within minutes, some key evidence could have been lost for good. What we found in the trash can was a pink robe. Why throw away a perfectly adorable robe? Better ask the owner. Sarah told us that uh, she did own a pink bathrobe. What did it suddenly go crashing out of style? And the Johnson's garbage holds even more promising clues for investigators. What we found was a leather glove and also a latex glove. With the evidence we found in the trash can, uh, detectives collected it and uh, sent it to the state lab. And when the results come back, Detective Harkins calls the investigative team for a briefing. As you all know, we found a trash can outside of the residence with a robe inside of it. On the robe, we found some blood splatter and some high-velocity mist. That DNA comes back to Alan and Diane Johnson. Why ever would her parents' blood be on Sarah's nice robe? A shocking truth is now clear. Sarah was not just home when her parents were killed. She was in the room. Was she just a witness, or is the truth far more devastating?
We also found inside the uh, pocket of the robe a latex glove. So they were wearing the glove not to leave fingerprints. Exactly. But what the killer didn't know is that he or she left behind something just as incriminating. Uh, inside that uh, glove we found skin cells and we believe that is the killer's DNA. But whose DNA is it? The answer may just reveal which of these Sun Valley sweethearts pulled the fatal trigger. Who isn't the skier in beautiful Sun Valley, Idaho that doesn't believe cold hands make for a warm heart? But detectives on the Johnson murder case believe a cold latex glove may make for a hot new lead. Knowing that we had a DNA from the latex glove, uh, we knew that we had to go to our suspects, which were uh, Bruno Santos, the boyfriend, and Sarah Johnson, and to send their DNA into the lab uh, to see if we get a match to what was found inside the latex glove. And when the results come in, investigators have their long-awaited answer. We have the DNA results. The laboratory called us and uh, told us of the results from the DNA found in the latex glove. They told me that it did belong to Sarah Johnson. The unthinkable has become reality. Little orphan Sarah is a murderer. She's taken the lives of the two people who loved her most of all. All the evidence pointed towards Sarah pulling the trigger. Well, that's tough to say, but I said it. The shocking news snowballs through town. I just can't believe it's the daughter. I mean, it, it, it's just both her parents just doesn't make sense to me. You gotta have some serious anger issues or you've got some real weird relationships well, going on with your parents. Well, I heard it was over the boyfriend. When confronted with the evidence against her, Sarah, like most naughty teenagers, points the finger elsewhere. She reported that the uh, cleaning lady had came to their house hours before the murder and was causing a disturbance in their front yard. She did give them the possibility that she might be involved. Nice try, Sarah. But detectives already know the cleaning lady was out of town. In fact, it was Sarah who cleaned house that morning. I knew her well, and I just I couldn't fathom her doing that. Wow. <laughs> to be 16 and to do something that brutal. Investigators are finally developing a picture of what happened on Sun Valley's darkest day. I believe on the morning of the murders, Sarah learned that her parents were going to turn in or report Bruno for the statutory rape charges. Um, and she knew she had to kill him to prevent that. She went to the guest house, grabbed a rifle, waited till the early hours of the morning. Heard her father get in the shower, walked in her parents' room, shot her mom in the head. But the job wasn't done yet. She went to the master bathroom, caught her dad coming out of the shower, shot him in the chest. Uh, she dropped the rifle. Uh, she ran out of the bedroom, left the house, and ran to a neighbor's house, uh, reporting that someone had just shot her parents. The details of these cold-blooded killings are enough to plunge this winter paradise into a very deep freeze. When you think of a young girl killing her parents like this, what goes through your mind? Well, I think of how those parents raised that kid from a young infant and then only to be repaid by a total selfishness. It's absolutely horrifying. She thought life was going to be hard without her boyfriend. You know, wait until she's doing a hard time. She'll see how good she had it. When it comes time for Sarah's trial, the stories keep coming. Her defense team tries to blame the whole thing on poor Bruno Santos. Now, we know he's involved in gangs. Is it possible that he acquired someone's help to commit these crimes? But the prosecution's case is just too strong. The evidence left behind bears silent witness to what happened in this case. After a five-week trial, Sarah Johnson is convicted of two counts of first-degree murder. At sentencing, she makes one final plea to the court. I loved my parents, and I love my family. I'm deeply grieving the loss of my parents, as well as the loss of my family, my home, my friends, and my community.
but in the end, Sarah faces the cold hand of justice. Sarah Johnson was sentenced to two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. As for her boyfriend Bruno, he is never charged with any involvement in the murders. The once carefree resort town of Sun Valley is now forced to face a heartbreaking ending to this tragic tale. Can you believe that? Yeah, I can't believe it. It's kind of strange. Hopefully the rest of the family can kind of move on. Yeah, I hope so too. It's really sad. As for Mel Spiegel, he's moved out of the Johnson's guest house, but he's having a hard time moving on. This was such a brutal murder, and these were such good people. It weighs heavily on the whole valley, the entire valley. Everyone knew these people. And to have this happen to such nice people, it's very sad. For the good citizens of Sun Valley, Idaho, this crime once hovered overhead like a dark cloud. But with justice served, they can finally look past the darkness to see the beauty that lies just beyond their ski tips. Sun Valley, Idaho is a haven for junkies. Adrenaline junkies, that is. But when a successful family is torn apart by a brutal crime... The only thing I've heard is that the police don't think it's random. This winter wonderland becomes gripped in fear. I heard they thought it was the person living in the guest house. As the locals hunker down, hoping to survive the most violent storm in centuries. And Robbie Datchler doesn't believe in handouts, except when it comes to her miniature horses and donkeys. They're very people-oriented. They come right up to you and want to know what you have in your pockets. But there's more to Robbie's life than just her four-legged friends. When she's not minding the pasture, she's tending the phone lines at the Blaine County Emergency Communications Center. 911, what is your emergency? The initial call came in from the neighbor and the neighbor's daughter had run to her home and was reporting that her parents had been shot. The emergency lines are jammed with 16-year-old Sarah Johnson's neighbors calling for help. There have been two gunshots. Um, okay, you need to get a hold of yourself and okay. tell me from where. Those shots were inside the house. They shot what house. Officers race to the home Sarah shares with her parents, Diane and Alan Johnson. These two people have been shot. At the scene, Blaine County Sheriff Walt Femling steps into his worst nightmare. When I first came into the house, a uh, long hallway, and I walked into the uh, master bedroom, and it was just really a horrific scene. Blood everywhere throughout the entire bedroom. Within seconds, the most terrifying discovery is revealed. I saw two deceased bodies uh, within the bedroom. Lying before him are Diane and Alan Johnson, shot dead in cold blood. I could see a rifle. Has the killer made a huge mistake, carelessly leaving behind a crucial piece to his identity? I left that scene and uh, called everybody out. The loss of Alan and Diane Johnson turns this posh ski town into a bitterly cold community. It's awful. You just never know. I have kids. Somebody could be looking over your shoulder at any time. It's scary. You know, on the surface, everyone looks so picture perfect. But you do a little digging and there's always a darker side. The entire community is skating on thin ice knowing somewhere in this valley hides a most vicious killer. Meanwhile, investigators are on the move. When I walked into the house and seen the bodies in the room, it was probably one of the worst things I'd ever seen. As Detective Steve Harkins takes over, he knows just where to start. I